been arrested for the fourth time in three months. And in the book that we used to log these in, my predecessor had written two nights earlier when he'd arrested for the third time, this guy has to be an alcoholic. This dentist was struck off. He'd lost his family, his business. He'd been in prison. He'd had massive fines. And I drove home at three in the morning thinking, if you can't control your drinking, you can't control your drinking and driving, I wonder how common that problem is. And the next person I need to thank is Professor, late Professor Jimmy Knox, because I had no idea how to do any research. And I went to Jimmy and said, I've got this idea. He put me in touch with Alec Mayer, who's the Professor of Public Health, who put Simon Oxton on as a statistician for the team, and uh, Jim Haggerty as a psychologist, and that was the beginning of the research. And the next big break was fund holding, where some are old enough to remember that Tayside Health Board used to call me Attila the Fund. Drew will not probably know this. Uh, and uh, the staff up there will no doubt say that we had great fun turning the health, side upside, health service upside down. I was lucky that Mo Malik in St Andrews trained me as a health services researcher in that time, a health services implementation researcher. And then I, along with Gordon Peterkin, was one of the first primary care trust medical directors. I then moved to Borders. Got bored to death with the bureaucracy and thought there has to be a better life and went to Australia. So that's the, the, uh, the, 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 the connections, if you like. Um, now, uh, this is called a grand round, but actually it's going to be more of a grand tour because we're going to give you 15 years of experience of diabetes prevention in two countries in about 40 minutes. So if we run over time, that's why. Ah, the arrow keys did work earlier. No, that's not it either. Yeah, got it. Okay, so really the important thing to recognize, if you want to get from randomized trials to things happening in the real world, it's like a really race of disciplines that runs from the basic sciences through preclinical research, various forms of clinical research, effectiveness studies, implementation research, and finally you actually get into the health service. The point about this is that if you're going from randomized trials there's the risk that the one-eyed man in the land of the blind is going to tell you how it can all be done. This is a multidisciplinary team game where you have to at least have uh, health psychologists, health services implementation researchers, and people at the right-hand end who know about quality improvement in healthcare and can actually embed it in systems for you. So roughly the tour that we're going to take you through is efficacy studies, does something work? Can you prevent type 2 diabetes? And that's all about internal validity. One variable is independent, everything else controlled. Effectiveness studies are concerned with where, when, and how does something work, and how do you make it work, and external validity. People who are involved in RCTs find it very difficult to move into that world because it's extremely messy. But the real world is messy. If you want to make it happen in the real world, that's what you have to do. So roughly what we're going to do is take you through the history where the Finns did the diabetes prevention study, the classic randomized trial showing that you could prevent type 2 diabetes and then we moved on to implement it and this I'm giving you because you're going to have 42 million pounds for diabetes prevention to catch up. So the first thing you do is a small evaluative trial in the real world, maybe 360 participants and we were lucky enough to be able to import from Finland the GOAL trial before it was published, before anyone knew about it, and set up in Australia and run two parallel things. And the reason that was possible was Tina Latike and Kainan's uh, postdoctoral year coincided with 2004. And then after you complete that and show you can do this in a small trial in the real world, it's about scaling it up eventually to cover Finland, Scotland, or in our case, the state of Victoria, which is roughly the same population as Finland or Scotland, but very much bigger than Scotland. So that's a tour of where we're going to go with this. And I'm going to hand over to Tina. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon for everyone. Greetings from Finland, where we have a heat wave. We have had two weeks, 30 degrees. So it's really pleasant weather here. <laughs> Okay, but I'll tell you shortly uh, what has happened in Finland in terms of diabetes prevention during the last decades. And uh, the first clinical trial 
to try to test whether we can really even prevent type 2 diabetes was actually carried out in Finland starting in 1993. And it was very, very soon followed by the large uh, DPP study from the U.S., uh, which was uh, carried out a few or started like a few years later. In the U.S. study, they, in addition to the lifestyle track, they also uh, tested the effect of metformin. But what is uh, kind of interesting is that um, these two studies, they actually got exactly the same result. So with certain lifestyle intervention, you can prevent, uh, or the relative risk reduction of type 2 diabetes is, is about uh, 58% even. And with the metformin in this U.S. study, they actually got 30% uh, risk reduction. And this was a randomized controlled trial with lifestyle intervention. Uh, and uh, it has been followed throughout the years. Uh, this picture is from the 13-year follow-up, showing that even the actual intervention was finished after four years. If the people participating the intervention were really able to learn the new lifestyle, they were able to keep up the good uh, effects of the intervention, so the good effects of the lifestyle changes. Usually we see that when some uh, dietary interventions or weight loss intervention finish, then people start to you know, gain up the weight again very easily in a few years. But here you see that uh, the, the effect has remained, it has sustained, so people have clearly been able to learn a new way of, of living through this uh, lifestyle intervention. And they are still benefiting from that after 13 years. But what is important there is that how, how intensive is the intervention, how well people are able to take up those new lifestyles. There were five key uh, aims in the intervention, weight reduction, moderate fat intake, low saturated fat intake, high fiber intake, and uh, regular physical activity. And this was based on uh, existing evidence at that time. Those were the factors that were known from other research to be effective in terms of weight reduction, and, and they were uh, kind of recognized as a risk factors for type 2 diabetes as well. And from this one, you can see that the more people were able to achieve the more goals they were able to achieve, the better was the outcome. So it's really a, um, a disease which has multi, multiple origins or multiple risk factors and reasons, and we have to try to uh, affect those all. So that was the evidence that we can prevent type 2 diabetes. Then the question was, how do we do it? How do we get people to change their lifestyles? Because that intervention was very intensive. People got face-to-face -face dietary counseling. They got free tickets to the gym. They got all kinds of intensive support, and that's something we can't really provide in the everyday uh, services. Uh, we don't have resources for that. And that was the phase when, uh, when the uh, health, health psychologists came into the game. And they started in, in Finland in one hospital district to carry out like an implementation trial. So how can they make that work in a real practice, in, in a real life? And um, that was uh, in the southern part of Finland, an area, which started to participate. And they created so-called goal project. Where they, ha where they kind of planned uh, a group intervention for, for people. They used the similar screening tools, what they had been using in the randomized uh, clinical trial, or which was actually developed based on the results of the trial. They used the same goals from this DPS study, the same lifestyle goals, but they created a, a social cognitive, based on the social cognitive behavioral model, they kind of created the, the training, the education for the intervention. So this is the FINDI risk tool, which might be very familiar for, for you. Um, this was developed really based on the Finnish uh, population risk uh, factor survey cohorts and the DPS study. And nowadays this has been um, validated and modified for, I, I think, uh, several, several countries around the world. And we are very, very much using this in Finland still. We are every now and then looking whether, whether it's still accurate or, or not, and it seems to work pretty well. So people were screened based on this very easy tool, which they can fill in themselves easily, don't need any uh, help of professionals if you just know these few simple answers to these few simple questions. 
And then the intervention was uh, tailored based on uh, health action process approach, one of, one of the social cognitive learning theories, so that there were six training sessions where people were really trained how to get on with their new lifestyles. And the key issue is there that people don't even have an intention to change if they don't have enough self-efficacy to do it, that they, they know that I can, I really can change my lifestyles. They also have to have outcome expectancies, that they have to have a feeling that if I change my lifestyle, I gain something better. And then they also have to have risk perception that if I don't change my lifestyle, if I continue like I'm doing now, I might be in the risk of getting type 2 diabetes. And if people don't have these three things in the beginning, they are not willing to change at all. And then, but if they have these, they, they can get an intention to change. And then the next step is to help them planning. How do I do it? What are the practical things? How do I then make this change to, to happen? And then in the planning phase, there's uh, tools like goal setting, feedback, all kinds of things, how you can support people to the change. And then they go to, to the um, later maintenance phases where they also need help, especially help from their social peers and, and environment to keep up then these habits. But anyway, this uh, goal intervention also used these same, uh, the same evidence from the earlier research for the intervention goals, uh, and then these uh, educational sessions were tailored and ad added to the program. Then uh, became the year that um, I, I was recruited to work with James in, in Australia, and I kind of borrowed the intelligence of my colleagues from, from Finland, and, and James was very willing to set up a similar interventions in, in Australian settings. And we more or less adapted the similar ideas, the similar theoretical background, the similar uh, behavioral background, psycho psychological background. But then what we did was that we kind of tailored that program then to Australian settings using Australian nutrition recommendations, physical activity recommendations, and, and like uh, all the, the local material. And uh, in that intervention, we also gained pretty similar results you have to look this kind of an upside down. So these are improvements. So these factors didn't increase, they decreased that amount, what you can see in the picture. But there was clear improvements in all the different clinical uh, outcome factors, what we were measuring in the intervention, uh, even in the, in the lipid and glucose levels of those who participated in the intervention. And uh, uh, and really, it was very much based on the, on the Finnish experience, but then tailored to the Australian settings. And uh, having, the, um, having kind of the understanding of the, of the local con context, uh, and then input from the local health professionals and experts, how do we carry out in, it in Australia? The one thing what was Always was, what was added in this phase, it, it seems that we always kind of then have to develop something new as well, was that we also took into account in this Australian intervention mental health issues. So this is kind of the main result. So in, 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 in this Australian intervention, we also saw clear uh, reduction, for example, in the mean waist circumference over 12 months uh, when carrying out this intervention. And then the question, of course, was that what are the issues that, that uh, really um, had effect uh, on, the, on these uh, clinical outcomes? So how were we able to achieve these particular outcomes? And we had tailored into this Australian intervention some, some psycho, uh, social measures in the questionnaire, so we were also able to measure whether the intervention had effect on self-efficacy, these risk perception, risk perception and outcome expectations. And we were able to analyze later on what were the critical factors uh, for success in that intervention. Uh, and this kind of shows that, shows that um, if the, those patients participating in the intervention were able to, to build up their self-efficacy skills or that they were able to build up their action planning skills, it clearly affected to their, to their lifestyles 
uh, there was clear association between the changes in their fat intake or in their fiber intake, and further on, they, there was a clear association then to the waist circumference reduction. Showing that when we tailor the interventions well, we have a uh, um, good um, content of that education, and we are able to, through that intervention, really train people this uh, <coughs> health action behavior approach uh, based on all this social cognitive theory based on, on um, um, measures or determinants, we can make the change. So in the meanwhile, in Finland, quite quickly after the DPS results were uh, released, they started to plan a national diabetes prevention program or a national diabetes program. It was not only prevention, it was also better management and uh, better self-care. But the primary prevention part was very strong there. And uh, that program was coordinated by the Finnish Diabetes Association. But it was mainly um, uh, carried through our public health service system. Because in Finland, the health services are very much, much based on, on the public health service system. So our primary care services are organized in health centers where we have multidisciplinary uh, working force working for primary care. So we don't have such like a separate uh, organizations uh, carrying out uh, preventive programs, but we usually embed them to the existing systems because of, of our service structure. So there were in the beginning uh, five hospital districts that were willing to be as a pilot district to, to start this work. And those districts covered uh, from our about 5.2 million people, uh, 1.5 million people at that time. And the way of, of doing this uh, Finnish DECO program was really that was really that uh, there were like ideas and uh, recommendations. Uh, there were not really any extra funding, but the hospital districts reorganized their work so that they were able to do more early detection of diabetes patients, to do detection of high-risk individuals, and then to provide them uh, appropriate services. So it was really reorganization of, of the service system. And these five uh, districts started the work, and then it was... Uh, enlarged to the whole country uh, later on. And, um, and in these five regions, then there was a separate evaluation study carried out, which is called FinD2D, where they also, where we collected a lot of data uh, from patients and from population actually as well to get better understanding of the diabetes rates, how many people are in high risk, what really happens then in those services when they reorganize and, and start to provide new type of services and so on. And what we, what we learned through that was that it was really, through that it was really demonstrated what is the magnitude of the diabetic epidemic in Finland. Uh, there was lots of screening, diagnostics and intervention developed in those hospital districts. Uh, there were new action models in prevention created. Uh, there were lots of organizational changes in primary care achieved. Uh, health promotion in general actually increased as well, and, and this um, diabetes, National Diabetes Association was very much uh, responsible for these population-level uh, activities. Uh, pu public awareness of, of the disease increased, and, uh, and it also showed that we can do diabetes prevention also in real life setting, uh, even on a large scale. Of course, there was also lots of difficulties, uh, and, and it kind of um, increased the understanding how we should really do that. The, the main results of, of the national DECO program were, were that uh, there was uh, like a national level diabetes prevention activities created in the country. It increased cl clearly the, the awareness level of population about the risk, uh, increased the screening of high-risk individuals, and improved diagnostics of undetected diabetes. We used to have the situation that 40% uh, of the diabetics were not diagnosed when we did population surveys and did oral glucose tolerance tests. Now, according to our latest population study, which was done in 2017, it looks like that there's about 3% of, of uh, uh, are anymore undiagnosed. So it's, it has clearly improved in these uh, 20 years. 
And then there were new strategies developed to intervene with high-risk individuals in, in primary health care. Then of, uh, nowadays, so we have a good service system that has developed a lot. We have a lot of population level activities carried out by different associations. One gap has been that how do we actually in the end identify the high risk individuals in the population and how do we get that flow happening from the, from the uh, society to the services and how the services can provide really good services for high risk individuals as well, not only the diabetes patients. And uh, now we have a, a project called Stop Diabetes going on. It is a large project in, in Finland, but again, it's carried out in three um, pilot districts. And the idea in that project is to improve the, the detection of, of high-risk individuals and then try to provide them, them uh, um, services to help to change their lifestyles. And we understand that the health service system can't tackle all this problem. Like in Finland, we have noticed from our population surveys that 25% of population are in high risk of type 2 diabetes. So we can't put them all to the health service system. We have to have other ways of intervening as well. And in this top diet project, there is like three key elements. It's this uh, individual level interventions, uh, changes in modifying the living environments to support the changes, and then uh, intervening also with uh, society to identify barriers and facilitators. But this is again, this is now carried out as a pilot project, some kind of an implementation research pro project. So we are now uh, working so that we, we use this FINDI risk tool, digital screening, which is available in the web. We kind of um, encourage people to, to do it, to test themselves. Uh, then they are digitally recruited through that uh, system uh, in these three uh, pilot districts. Uh, and they are now randomized to three groups, who, who, people who have care as usual, serving as controls. Then we have developed them a digital intervention that they can use with their mobile phone. And then the third group is using this digital intervention, plus they are also provided in primary care services, face-to-face -face, uh, intervention. And we kind of want to look, can we uh, also do this through the mobile technologies? Can we, what kind of effect we can have uh, to, in diabetes prevention using uh, mobile technologies. So uh, this is the, the tool what has been developed. It is based on Fox tiny habit ideology that people, it's much easier for people to pick up tiny little habit changes little by little and, and there's kind of a an, an library of different uh, lifestyle habit changes or kind of suggestions what you can do on the diff 13 different topics, physical activity, alcohol use, diet, stress, sleep, and so on and so on. And there are hundreds and hundreds of, of tiny habits and people can create those themselves as well. So it kind of expands uh, all the time. And they can be very easy, like things like, okay, I put my mobile phone aside while I'm eating. I'm concentrating on my eating. I'm not doing things at the same time and things like that. So it's like simple things what people promise to do. And then they also get feedback through the system. And that cost of that is about four euros per user per year to use such an app. And then there is this group counseling sessions provided by primary care for those who are then in addition willing to, to join those. And uh, it's very much following the same ideology than these our earlier interventions, having group sessions and, and ha having certain session topics where people are, are teach these um, uh, so the key elements for the lifestyle change determinants. And that is about uh, 40 euros per participant per year to organize that in the primary services when it's organized through the existing uh, professionals. And uh, we, have, uh, we have done some analysis. We are, that is just ongoing, so we don't have any results yet. What we know is something about the recruition, how, recruit, recruitment, how that has happened. So up to now, more than 100,000 digital risk, risk tests has been filled in. And even you can see the pilot areas as a dark brown in the map. So clearly, of course, it has been promoted more there, so more people have filled in the risk test there, but it has, has a national effect as well. So it has been filled in other areas as well. These small areas, there are all these 300 municipalities in Finland, so our system is very scattered. But you can see that in those pilot areas, 
uh, more than 5% of population have filled in the risk test, which I think it's quite good. And uh, up, to, up to now, um, there is uh, about 3,000 people who, who are participating in the study at the moment in, in those areas. And in, in two years, we will know more how this works, but this is how the development has come so far. Thank you, Tina. Now, there's a meta story going to happen. Um, diffusion of innovation in healthcare, most of you would tell me how long it takes 10 years, 15 years, 100 years, whatever. Uh, what we're now going to show you <coughs> is how diabetes prevention activity moved from the randomized control result in 2002 to the end of an evaluative trial in 2006 and scaled up across the whole of the state of Victoria in 2007. So, the meta story is look for how you do that quickly. Because in Scotland, if you're going to spend your £42 million pounds well, and I hope you do, um, you're going to benefit from what's gone before in Finland, Australia, uh, the United States, and possibly a bit from England, although that might be more difficult. Okay, so it's going to be in a policy setting. Uh, we had two policies that worked. Our ministers of states and uh, federal come together, and they had a chronic disease strategy that had identified Prevention of type 2 diabetes is the big priority. A smart health bureaucrat realised that the um, Council of Australian Governments, which is the Prime Minister and the Premiers, um, were working on human capital, how to make Australia more competitive. And the health bureaucrat said, well, uh, diabetes is going to hit the workforce big style, and they produced the economic evidence for that. They had the evidence from the US Diabetes Prevention Program and the Finnish DPS to show that you can prevent type 2 diabetes. And we had just reported on the Greater Green Triangle results, so we'd shown that we could do it in Australia. You've got similar things about to happen. So what happens is you have government presented with problems, and we're all presented with the problems of increasing diabetes, and everything goes with it. You get proposals coming along and a policy, windows open, a policy window opens up. And I'm guessing that for you, the launch, was it last week, of Scotland's Diet and Healthy Weight Delivery Plan is your policy window. And policy windows don't stay open for long. Jump through now. Get yourselves together with a good plan. So this is the sort of stuff that needs to happen. The government needs to put up a lot of money. Uh, we chose to not... We'd used FinRisk as how we chose people for entry to the Greater Green Triangle program. The argument in Australia is that we have a multi-ethnic population. In Melbourne, there are 250 languages spoken at home. We needed to modify it for that, but we didn't have the data to do it. Anyway, we developed our own Australian score. You have to set up your national standards based on all the evidence there is around about uh, what works in the real world. You've got to incentivize general practice to find these people. And, of course, you've got to fund the interventions. It's no good asking busy people to do more work. So here's our questionnaire, pretty colours. I'll comment on the benefit of, or disbenefit of doing that. Life taking action on diabetes was the scaling up of the Greater Green Triangle Diabetes Prevention Programme for the state of Victoria, which, as I say, has a population about the size of Scotland and Finland. Funded by the Victorian Government, and in, they put CVD into the title from the end of the first five years. It's important, and I say this because you're coming at it from obesity through your strategy. This is not about weight reduction. This is about preventing people dying from cardiovascular consequences, including dementia, which it affects. We got our NGO to run it, not uh, the government. The government's not very good at running things. It was, in the first five years, targeted at 25,000 Victorians. You'll see how we did with recruitment in a minute based on GGT, as I said, and we did all the training and development. And I became the director of training and development for this program for the first five years. So we didn't get 25,000. We got just around, under, well under half that interested, including the ones who are getting a phone coaching course. As you can see at every stage, there's a fallout, dropout. Um, session six occurred... Uh, two, three months almost after the session five, uh, Diabetes Australia made the decision to pay all the money at the end of session five. They thought this would keep providers in the game. 
I said that won't work, being a Scotsman, I understood better how financial incentives work, and lo and behold, we had a very poor rate of completion of the programme in session six. Don't make that mistake. And the phone coaching worked quite well, too. So, how did it work? Well, it works the purchase of provider thing. Diabetes Australia has, Diabetes Victoria had the money, and they allowed anybody to become a provider, because we wanted to grow a workforce very fast. You therefore had then to pass, so we had accreditation standards, so they actually had to be uh, suitable, a whole, whole bunch of uh, tests of, of that. They had to take on to do the recruitment, but there were other recruitments. There was a general practice recruitment strategy. Pharmacy was extremely good because pharmacists can pick, people, pick out the people who are at risk. Uh, it went statewide very fast. We had standards for training and accrediting the facilitators that delivered it and continuous uh, measurement of their performance. A strictly defined intervention. And if you don't have that, you're going to go badly wrong. Continuous quality improvement, we tried to build in as much as we could, but actually government wasn't terribly good at funding it. And we collected a lot of data. And the argument wasn't for research, the argument was to measure the quality of the service and to persuade government what it got for its money. Well, here are the results. I haven't talked about the Melbourne Diabetes Prevention Study because this is an unusual study where we did a randomised control trial within the scaled-up intervention. I don't know if anyone has ever done that in the world before. And you'll see that um, if you take the original GGT results, the LIFE program was doing not badly by comparison with that. And we calculated, and this is published in Diabetes Care, that the reduction in diabetes risk was somewhere between 25 and 40 percent, which compares with 58 percent in the RCTs. And you'd hope with quality improvement you increase the voltage and get higher. Um, not as good as GGT-DPP, but then it was a very personalized service, that one. But the interesting thing is the MDPS, where, as you can see, the participants are much older. Um, they're lighter than in GGT, about the same as life. And the explanation for what had happened was we had, and this is a real risk, um, we'd recruited older, healthier participants. The um, problem was that our Australian risk score was heavily weighted on age. So we got a lot of old people in there who were basically healthy adults. Their lipids and blood pressure were cro close to the population targets, and their HbACs were such that in the United States they would not be offered an intervention. So we'd failed to recruit the people that we really should have recruited. But there were successes, and I think the thing I would really emphasize is that you need to keep policymakers, government, who have designed it, the implementers, who in our case were Diabetes Victoria, and the evaluators, who were my team and others, working together. So we worked together for the first five years. And we recognized early on that learning was the key to implementation, and our motto was that we evaluated to learn and we learned in order to implement. Now that's easily said, but that actually is the key to successful implementation. We were successful because we had a successful political environment. The state premier personally wanted this program and it has been funded by both political parties subsequently, still funded. And the crucial bit was that the three groups researchers, implementers, and policy makers agreed on a strictly defined intervention. It was none of the usual uh, politics over performance nonsense that you get. Um, and they agreed on a highly developed training program. We didn't do everything right, and the reason for that was that um, I was going to the first important meeting on, on scaling it up and walking along the pavement with the CEO of Diabetes Victoria. He said, um, we're going, to get we're going to get $400 for every participant. I said, you can't do it for that money. No one had asked me before they decided on the sum of money. Don't let, let that happen to you. Because, of course, we then had to drop some of the really good features of the original program, which is why we got a lower result. You'll also find that your facilitators vary a lot from those who think you just wag your finger and tell people to lose weight to those who can genuinely solve problems and, and should actually achieve it that every participant is creating their own diabetes prevention program based on the goals they set for themselves. We also trained 100 facilitators very quickly, but our recruitment was so much slower than we expected that many of the facilitators waited up to six months 
to get the first group. So terrible skills fade during that initial six months. And we had a real difficulty persuading government that they should invest in a quality improvement cycle. You have a better tradition of that, actually, with, is it now called Health Improvement Scotland? It used to be Quality Improvement Scotland. We have a tradition of that, which will be a great help to you. So the main lessons, keeping the three groups together, hazard of developing a questionnaire as your entry point for the intervention. And we would now argue that you should only recruit people who have disc glycemia by one of these three tests. Get a really good quality improvement program in there, and you have experts in that in Scotland. And also, one of the things that got dropped was the uh, measurement and feedback. Measuring someone's cholesterol, in our case, it's the three-month point in the program, is a powerful measure of how well they're doing on diet. Repeated feeding back of diet diaries, measurement feedback, measurement feedback, makes a big difference to people, and the same with the blood pressure. Completely changing topic now. Mothers after gestational diabetes is the name of our um, research project looking at prevention of diabetes in uh, women who've had gestational diabetes. In Australia, the rates used to be 6%, and then there was an international agreement to lower the threshold for diagnosis, which has more than doubled it. It's now sitting about 13%, and in some populations, it's 30%. Our ethnic, uh, particularly Indian and Chinese populations. The government sees this as a policy problem. You can't ask GP to take on a follow-up of all that load. You've got to do something about it. We know that uh, women are wave goodbye from the hospital. You're fine now. Your diabetes is gone. And you've got a healthy baby. Neither thing is true. They're heading for the cliff, most of them. And the baby is also at risk. And yet we know that the lifestyle modification programs work. There's only been one study to look at the conversion rate uh, to type 2 diabetes. And as you can see in this meta systematic review meta-analysis, it's a sevenfold increase. But if you look at the top study in Canada, which is the biggest one, terrible heterogeneity here, you'll see it's a much higher thing. So we still don't really know the rate at which people convert. And that's terribly important if we want to address the group at highest risk and put our resources to them. What we also know from the US Diabetes Prevention Program that had a subgroup of women that had had gestational diabetes. Um, let me just explain the graph first of all. On the top, you have women who've never had gestational diabetes, and on the bottom, women who have had gestational diabetes. And the important line is the dotted line, and the fact that the women who've never had gestational diabetes are much more likely to take up lifestyle modification than women who've had GDM. So before you ever start, women in that population are less amenable to lifestyle change. So we um, are unique in the world. We think from Colm's extremely well-organized conference in Edinburgh these last days, we think we're the only people in the world who have taken a systems approach to this problem. Screening. In Australia, all women are, should have been screened for gestational diabetes by the 28th week of pregnancy. At that point, they are entered onto a national gestational diabetes register. It's voluntary, but the point at which the diagnosis is made, that's the usual thing. The register is actually a consequence of the research study we set up. We plan to do it as part of our research. The CEO of Diabetes Australia was one of our chief investigators. He happened to be at a meeting with the minister and had a chance, and he took it. Why don't we set up a national register on the back of the National Diabetes Services Scheme? So we then had to rearrange all our research. Um, every patient should be recalled indefinitely because they're at risk for our and provided with whatever clinical care that, 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 didn't, that, that requires. Study one is the data linkage where we looked at linking, stop, Dougie Boyle, who used to work with Andrew Morris and was here yesterday. This, Dougie led this bit of the study from the University of Melbourne. So what we were then able to do was look at our two state perinatal databases in the study, South Australia and Victoria, which is a denominator, every birth there, every GDM diagnosis. Look at the National Register and see what the performance was, because we could also get about 60% of the laboratory blood tests for these two states. And to cut a long story short, the register sends out reminder letters to the women at six weeks postnatally to come for their glucose tolerance, and every year after that. 
with a lot of health promoting stuff as well. Somehow I've lost a graph here. Yes, here we are. Now, this is actually taken from date of registration, which is why it might seem odd times. What it shows is we can pick up that they go for their glucose tolerance test, but it's only about 30% of them that do. So, of course, we're also picking up that some of them are being offered fasting blood glucose before discharge. Now, and only if they're over six are they uh, asked to go for the OGTT. The really important thing, um, which we found with graphing this, is that nothing is happening as a result of the register's letters. So although the letter goes to the woman and her GP, there's no activity, no discernible activity that can be attributed to the letters, which stunned us. A quite unexpected finding because we thought, like cervical cytology or breast screening, it would, would actually be effective. The next part of it was offering an intervention during the first uh, year after birth. Um, again, by this stage, we got a bit more sophisticated with the five goals of the Finnish Diabetes Prevention Study and taught the women to think of having these things on their fingers. You recognize a very similar design that we had come up with for the women, but we'd made a bit of modification because of wanting to um, make it easier for the women. So the individual session was in their own home. Blood tests were always taken in their own home. Two sessions delivered by phone to try and make it easier for the women. Basically, we showed that we could prevent a bit of weight gain, but not much else. No change in uh, dysglycemia or, or glycemic measurement. And the reason is quite simple. Only 10% of these women went to all the sessions. Um, we used uh, a PPS, which meant uh, one individual session and one group session. We would count them in for that. But basically, there were 34% went to no sessions. Among the 10% who went to all the sessions, we could actually detect all the changes we were looking for, but not at significant levels. And again, part of the reason for this is that if you look at these women, they are certainly overweight, but they appear to be doing the physical activity that you would want, and their dysglycemia is not there at this stage. We only had a small proportion who had IFG or IGT. They also have HbACs again below the level at which they'd be offered an intervention in the US. So the very low attendance and completion rates during that intervention the huge staff that we had to try and get them in and keep them in the intervention, which just couldn't be done in a routine health service, the fact that so few were dysglycemic made us think that we really had to be thinking beyond the first year for the intervention. So we set up a quality improvement collaborative, which um, you've had collaboratives in primary care in Scotland in the past, so you're familiar with what that is. Um, and the two measures we set were that 100% of the women should have had a screening test within 15 months and a consultation, usually with the practice nurse, to discuss diabetes prevention. And this, this is what happened. That's just what the study is. So the numbers on the register went up and the numbers being screened went up. But it, in a cloud, it's better to express it in terms of percentage change because the number on the register is changing the whole time as you get better at finding people. And what we've got here is that if you get the general practices to f make their own register and follow up their own patients, they will get the screening rates for these women up quite high, and this is over 15 months only. But the uh, um, prevention consultation is much harder to get the women in. So our next stage, of course, is to put this through a full randomized trial in which we run it for longer than 15 months and see whether, in fact, to deal with women in... Uh, just, who've had gestational diabetes, the follow-up through, organized follow-up through primary care is the way to do it. So our conclusion is diabetes prevention for high-risk women is possible in primary care, but interventions offered in the first year are ineffective. And if you ask me why, um, I think you have to ask yourself, if you were a woman who has a baby under a year, and you have a choice of going to the diabetes prevention session or catching up on your sleep, which are you going to choose? I um, should acknowledge our team, extensive and large team. And uh, I should also acknowledge my wife, among those who have shaped uh, this whole thing, who's not here because 
Uh, our younger daughter had twins two weeks ago, and Granny's a bit busy right now. So, any questions? Tina, do you want to join me up here, please? Thank you very much. I'm sure there will be some questions. So let me see if I can just get the microphone working. This is the first question from Downfield, I might add. <laughs> Fiona, uh, yes, we considered it. With anything that you do, context is everything in health services. Um, our community nurses, uh, were, we approached them because we thought that's an obvious place to go, and they simply said, we're too busy. Um, when we spoke to the chief health officer for the state, equivalent of chief medical officer, he said, well, I'm not surprised. Couldn't we try to get them to... Uh, try and persuade mothers to stop smoking, they, they gave us the same answer. Now, you may have health visitors with an entirely different tradition and be able to bring them in on this. So the answers are very local. We've given you kind of general stuff that you can move from one country to another. How you do it, that's local. Thanks, James. It's been very helpful. Um, I, I'd like your opinion, actually, on um, your stance on legislation as as the way to go here rather than lifestyle programmes and is, oh, there, any, okay. is there any evidence okay. uh, that legislation has a greater effect or has that even been looked at? Okay, well it will be an opinion and Tina will have one too. Um, it's been the view of people in diabetes prevention for a long time that both the population approach and the high risk approach are required. As it happens we generated better evidence around the high risk approach until very recently. But we've seen things recently, for instance, the salt substitution story in the UK, the sugar tax in a number of countries that includes the UK, that legislation and regulation can be very effective. I guess what's happening is the vested interests are not holding it up so much as they used to. In fact, I gather with um, the uh, regulation and legislation for salt, industry were in favour of it because that created a level playing field. And if somebody broke the rules, then, you know, um, so I personally, I mean, I, I go back to drinking and driving, all right? That was where I started doing research. And before that, some of you are old enough to probably remember Jimmy Savile, clunk, click every trip. We went on and on about that stuff, and we got 20% of people to wear seat belts. The day the seat belts came in, everybody was wearing seat belts. I used to do forensic pathology part-time as part of my police work here in the days when it was done at DRI. And I remember Ivan Jacobson, who was a neurosurgeon, coming in and saying, I've got empty beds. Because suddenly, you know, the, 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 the smacking up the head was going down. And I turned and said, oh, don't, don't worry, Ivan, you've got a waiting list. It'll fill up. And it did. So, Tina. Yeah, I think in Finland we are great believers of these structural changes and, and effects of the legislation, especially because of our experience based on how the smoking rates have gone down through, through those uh, activities, and it, they are extremely effective, and they usually kind of uh, cover the whole population. But if we think of, of things uh, which are not smoking and alcohol but are eating and physical activity, you can't do it always the same way. Of course, you can support people, you can change environments, and you can have some legislation, some restrictions, but, but everybody has to eat and everybody has to move from place to place, and, and there's very much also a personal choice. And we, then we have this group of high-risk individuals who also need other types of, of help, and we really need some, some help and services for, for them as well, which we need to provide some, some other way. Yeah, there, there is evidence on, on both, but we kind of, we need really both. Yeah. Actually, it's a very important point that uh, 
you don't want to in your discussion about for when you've got 42 million pounds a whole bunch of people are going to suddenly be very interested and one thing you can't have is a civil war between the high risk approach and the population approach people you've got to get everybody to agree it's both Do you want to take first? Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah I, I think you don't, like, at this phase, we, all, we have done lots of RCTs already. We, we know more or less uh, what we need to do. We need to get people to move more and eat less and have this and that kind of diet and, and so on. And if we can do that, we know that there will be effects. And now it's more a question that how do we do it and how do we do it in different circumstances and in different populations. And I think it's really a place for implementation science more and, and to really define those effective methods. And I don't think there you all, don't always need randomized control trials, but more clever implementation science to show the, the effects. I agree with Tina. I, I think we're well better on doing randomised trials. We've got all the evidence we need. Scotland will be wasting its time it did. You need to do a small implementation trial where it's a within, indi within individual control, no control group. That's cheap, easy to do. Get that done and then get on with rolling it out. So you know, the main work actually is finding out what's worked in other places, then adapt it for your setting here. I think your obesity strategy is superbly comprehensive. I don't think they've missed a trick. Um, and you do all that, that's great. The, the strange anomaly about the high-risk approach for diabetes prevention is exactly what you say. Normally, when you're talking about a high-risk group, you're talking about 5% of the population or something, whereas here it's way above that. The answer, therefore, is, of course, that you provide it for those really at highest risk, those who've got HbA1c above 6 or something, 6 to 6.5, I think is what the English have gone for. And you don't pro provide it for anything below that. And you've got to have all these population things which are in your strategy. May I continue? Go. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's really so that we are very much thinking that, yeah, we have one program and then we are measuring the effect of that, but that's not going to help in, in this circle. We know how, how complicated, for example, is this obesity epidemic, how many different reasons it has. We have to have several parallel things happening at the same time, different recommendations, legislation, programs, services, and if we can kind of add up that little by little, having different approaches going on parallel at the same time. I think that's really the way to go. Are there any other questions? Thank you both very much uh, for great presentations. Uh, Drew Walker from, from Public Health. Uh, so just uh, to answer the question about the environment, the new strategy uh, for, for Scotland in Dundee will be taking both approaches, both the high risk uh, approach in terms of uh, um, preventing uh, type 2 diabetes and early intervention in, in people with, uh, with type 2 diabetes, but also addressing what we call the obesogenic environment in Dundee, which is it's a toxic environment as far as, uh, as weight gain is concerned. So that was the point I wanted to make. The, the question I have is around health inequalities. We know that population approaches to this kind of program almost inevitably widen health inequalities because the people who are most affluent benefit the most and the people who are least affluent benefit the least. So you need to build into the programmes a way of counteracting that. Have you been able to do that in a way that 
hasn't led to a widening of health inequalities uh, uh, in your in your programmes in Finland and Australia? We discuss this so often. I'm going to let you take this whole. I know the answer, so I know Tina's answer. So there you go. Okay, actually, in the gold program which I presented you, which was that implementation trial in a small area in Finland where they took into uh, these uh, psychological measures to help people to change their lifestyles, they actually, actually measured the effect uh, based on the socioeconomic status of the participants. And what they were able to show was that it was equally effect, effective for for all the dif- for all the different socioeconomic groups but then the challenge is that how do we get to the, get those people to these intervention interventions and there we would need some maybe some more research and development how do we really kind of engage the people from so lower socioeconomic groups but if we can get them in it seems that they they are they benefit as as much as as uh, those who belong to higher socioeconomic groups I think yes, Steve, and there are a number in the audience who were there and heard this too. Uh, the U.S. National Diabetes Prevention Program, which is humongous, um, they, they had a slide which went up quite quickly, but I took from it that their effect was in equal among all social groups. Is that what you took? Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. So, do your arguments one which we often hear, we often get, we, I've been asked that in Australia. Um, but I think it's easy, see, perhaps easier to say there's no real evidence that that's true. I think, in fact, Erkey used to say that the higher social economic groups sort it out for themselves. It's actually the lower social economic groups that need the help. Any other questions? Well, I think it's approaching two o'clock, so I think we okay. should uh, simply thank both uh, Tina and James for a fantastic presentation, very thought-provoking, and I think relevant to uh, lots of different groups within the audience, so I'd like to thank you both and hope you've enjoyed your trip. Our pleasure. Thank you.